Hi everyone, can you hear me? Um, apparently I have some slides to show, but since I don't know what's on them, I'm not going to show them. <laughs> uh, I want to welcome you all to uh, Interface's uh, graduate training program annual symposium. I don't know exactly how many symposia we've had because we had to do a couple remotely, but um, in the, we're entering the 18th year of this program uh, and we started um, in 2006, uh, beginning of 2006, with a, an award from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, and uh, as part of their Interfaces program, that's how we got the name Interfaces. Uh, and then in 2009, we got the first uh, uh, of our now about to be renewed for the third time, so our fourth, will be our fourth cycle of the NIBIB training grant. Um, su supported by the NIH on multiscale biology. And uh, we are fortunate this year, uh, as we have had at most of our retreats or symposia over the years, have uh, a visit from our uh, external advisor, um, Professor Mike Rainier from the University of Washington. Um, so when you see Dr. Rainier, don't run away, talk to him. Okay? <laughs> also, he's very friendly, and we've known him for a very long time, and he not only has collaborated with um, my lab, but also many trainees in this Interfaces graduate program for many years, uh, working with faculty from a number of different departments in the Interfaces graduate training program, including um, Professor Rangamani and Professor Andy McCammon and Romeo Maro. Um, so he actually knows the, not only the faculty and the students, um, but uh, through uh, his sort of engagement with our program has been um, you know, become a collaborator, and uh, as you will uh, learn during the day, uh, his lab is very interested in the theme of multiscale biology, uh, and uh, we're actually we're actually very fortunate that we're joined today by his longtime collaborator uh, from the UK, uh, Professor Mike Jeeves, uh, but also two of his uh, trainees, um, Sage Allengren and, and and Matt Childers, who are actually going to present. Um, because their work is so closely related to the theme of our program um, that uh, I thought it would be a great opportunity for you, know, you to interact with them. Um, this is a student organized event and uh, as it has been every year for many years and so I wanted to thank all of the uh, student organizers, Alex and Kristen, where's Kristen? And uh, Danny Gonzalez, she can't be here because she got tested positive for COVID. Um, and Justin and, and Nathaniel, uh, uh, Daniel Milstein, um, Bianca, and um, Joseph, and Will. Um, so I want to thank all of them for working uh, with the staff, uh, Kelly Raymond and uh, Irene Hakovo on organizing this event and for all the 
our active participation of all the students in our programs and our, uh, in our uh, lunch uh, symposia, uh, lunch uh, seminars and our retreats uh, and, and this symposium. So I really want to uh, thank you. And I'm really excited that um, the students have chosen as part of the program to invite a number of our uh, <coughs> faculty members, particularly early career faculty members, um, to be presenters. And the first one um, coming up in a minute will be Professor Conchichok from Bioengineering. Um, later we'll hear from Professor Joe Schoenberg in Chemistry and Biochemistry and Pharmacology. He's a new hire who does work on lattice light sheet imaging that I think you'll find uh, very cool. Uh, also, um, Camille Gadula from Chemistry and Biochemistry will be joining us, um, and Professor Valdez Hasso from Bioengineering. Um, we also have um, uh, Professor Vera Kravitz here from uh, Bioengineering. She's a brand new faculty member in Bioengineering, and um, I'm really thrilled that she can be here. She will be a faculty member on the training grant herself, um, and um, so I hope you get a chance to talk to her. Um, I think with that, uh, I should hand back to the organizers to keep us on, on schedule and to introduce the first speaker. All right, um, thank you, Professor McCulloch, for the introductions. My name's Joseph, um, and uh, I'll be one of the MCs. Nate, right there, is the other MC. So just a quick, um, uh, before we get started, um, we have the restrooms, they're out those doors, and in the, uh, basically the restaurant to the left. And then just a reminder that we can't have any food and drink here. Um, so before we begin, I just wanted to introduce to you all um, Francisco uh, Contajoc uh, from uh, Bioengineering. So his research, uh, it focuses on developing MRI and CT imaging methods to improve um, assessment of Cardi cardiopulmonary function. Um, and so he's a, a PhD, uh, sorry, he's a professor who got his PhD um, at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and prior to that, he, uh, his faculty appointment, he has a postdoctoral fellowship um, at the Division of Cardiology here at UC San Diego. So if you can all give a warm welcome to um, Dr. Uh, Kantajuk. Great, good morning. Uh, thanks for the invitation. It's actually a real privilege uh, to be here to me and, and kind of full circle. Uh, I was actually part of an interfaces program at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, similarly funded by HHMI that then became a, a training grant. So it's a little different. It wasn't necessarily multi-scale biology. That one was bringing together engineering, imaging, and medicine. So um, my background is, is kind of reflects that. Um, we did all of the medical school curriculum that was part of the innovative uh, training, so I've forgotten more anatomy and, and organ systems that I care to admit. Um, but we got to go into the afternoon and do all of our imaging kind of uh, courses and, and understand the language and, and kind of perspectives of the clinicians. So it was a really great program and I'm happy to, to give back in any way I can. Um, I also teach one of the imaging lab courses that's part of this uh, training program where you actually get to come to the CT and MR scanners and, and do your own experiments and, and get your own images and, and deal with some of the real problems when you're working with either a clinically made system that has already made some trade-offs for you uh, and or you're trying to balance things like how long do you want to spend there, uh, you know, can you leave the sample in overnight or, or do you have to be done in, in 10 or 20 minutes. Uh, so if any of you are interested in that course, a couple of uh, the, the people here in the audience are in it now and, and I'm happy to, to talk about it moving forward. So. Uh, I don't really do much at the, at the kind of small biology scale, so my, my talk hopefully maybe complements some of the ones coming later. Uh, we try to address cardiopulmonary uh, questions using clinically used imaging systems. So we primarily image patients. Um, some of them are, are quite young. We have a project with the pediatrics department at, and uh, Radies Children's Hospital uh, that's just started this summer. But um, the picture on the right is a CT scan of someone's heart as the iodine has been injected into their arm and then travels to their heart. And you can see all four chambers. Uh, this is all acquired in one heartbeat. So this scan basically took less than a second to acquire. Uh, so from an imaging perspective, that's, that's really fantastic. Uh, the bane of my existence is coming up with methods where you ask people to hold their breath for two minutes. And it usually works great in 
24 year old graduate students that are developing the methods and test it on themselves. And then you go over to cardiology and the people are short of breath at rest, right? They, can, they can't even hold their breath normally. And now you're asking them to go into a small tube and hold their breath for, for 30, 40 seconds. Uh, and if they don't, then the image looks very kind of poor. Uh, so part of it is trying to build methods that are robust and can uh, actually give us some, some clinical information. Uh, so I wanted to start, we, our, our lab uh, shown on the top was a picture of the summer, but we've also been very grateful to get support from both the NIH as well as some uh, industry support and, and support from the University of California as a whole. And so our lab probably, I, I was thinking about this talk uh, earlier this week, have, focuses you know, on the first part is how do we just make our imaging better? And so in CT, that can mean how do you minimize radiation to the patient, or how do you get the most information for the least amount of radiation, for example. Um, in MRI, that's often more of a question of image quality or time in the scanner. Um, and then how do we do our analysis kind of more robustly and, and better? If you're a graduate student in cardiac imaging, for a long time, a lot of your life meant drawing circles around parts of the heart that you wanted to measure the size or the volume of. Uh, and things like AI and, and other kind of more robust methods are, are hopefully making that uh, a thing of the past. And the idea now is that instead of you know, me subjecting you to analyze 100 hearts and draw a million circles, you do that once now, you train an AI, and now you can analyze all of the images you can ever acquire. And so our studies can be you know, well, more well-powered and, and really kind of more applicable broadly. You would then graduate and I'd have to train someone else and never quite replicate your results. And so that's also something that is, is better with a better method. But for this talk, I figured I would focus more on some of the physiology questions that we're interested in. And so primarily we, we've tackled two areas, which is what's the role of the right ventricle in left ventricular disease? The RV has been called the forgotten ventricle. It's often uh, kind of ignored, by the, depending on, on the disease population. It's, it's literally stuck next to the left ventricle, but it shares a wall. Uh, it has to have the same heart rate as your left ventricle, but it operates under very different conditions. It's tightly coupled to the lungs, and I'm sorry if this is a review for, for some of you, but uh, at least from a kind of cardiac imaging perspective, it's, it's kind of an afterthought oftentimes. Um, and so not only can we tell things about the patients who have left ventricular disease by looking at the right ventricle, but also understanding the lungs and, and the, the coupling between the two is also incredibly important. You often get into this chicken and the egg type of problem, which is, is the right ventricle failing because of the lung, or is the, the RV itself um, RV itself uh, failing, and, and that's kind of not going to be solved by any treatment to the lungs that, you, that you're considering. So I basically have a couple examples here of projects we've recently done, uh, and I like to highlight the folks who did the work are kind of in the top right on most of the slides. Uh, so the first project that I want to talk about is the role of the right ventricle in aortic stenosis. So in aortic stenosis, you have a valve that is restricting flow on the left ventricle. So this is the valve that goes from the left ventricle to your aorta and to your heart, or to your uh, rest of your body. And there's some different subtypes. I'm sorry this came out a little smaller than I thought. Um, there's a typical aortic stenosis where your heart starts to pump. Um, you have a small aortic valve area, so you're pushing a lot of flow across a small area, and you get a pressure gradient. And that causes the heart to have to work harder and harder. And then there's this other subtype called paradoxical aortic stenosis, where you have a small valve. You see that on imaging. And you're not pushing quite as much flow across it. And so you don't get the pressure gradient that you would typically need to call someone uh, aortic stenotic uh, patient. And so the question is, is the small output that the heart is generating, is it because the heart is failing and the valve is limiting and you need to relieve it? Or is there something else happening that is limiting the flow of the heart or the contractility of the heart such that if you open the valve up, you're not going to solve the problem? Um, and it's been documented that these patients have worse outcomes. They have uh, more futile procedures like getting a valve replaced. Uh, and so what is the, the kind of the real cause of, the, of these people's impairment. So uh, one thing we can use CT for, like I showed earlier, is to look at the, the beating heart. Uh, so this is now sliced uh, slightly differently, but on the picture on the left, you can see a patient. These both have aortic uh, stenosis. I'm trying to see if I can find my cursor here. Um, how do I? Let's see if I can do laser pointer. There we go. All right, so here, this is the, to orient you, this is the left ventricle. It looks like a donut, and it's beating essentially concentrically. Uh, in this case, because of the resistance, it's, it's having to beat harder than, than you would normally see. And then this crescent-shaped uh, ventricle here on the, to the left-hand side of the donut is the right ventricle. And so the question is, how is that doing? So in the picture on the left, this is actually fairly preserved right ventricular function. I think if I play the next one on the right, there we go. The one on the right, you should hopefully appreciate that it's, it's contracting far less. Uh, vigorously. 
And so the question is, is that a harbinger of, of things to come? Uh, the other question that the clinicians often uh, struggle with is people have many comorbidities. And so you're worried that the person, you know, if they're a life long, lifelong smoker or they have any sort of lung impairments, is it really something that's a heart problem or you're going to fix the valves? And in fact, what's limiting them is the fact that they have really bad COPD uh, or some other uh, lung impairment. So not only can we look at the heart here with this CT scan, but we can also look at the lungs. Uh, and so this uh, basically showed our, our two results, which was that we found that in these patients in paradoxical AS, they had decreased right ventricular performance. So they had a lower RVEF. At the same time, they didn't have any signs on CT imaging of kind of destructive COPD or emphysema or, or imaging markers that, that you would associate. So oftentimes the clinicians say, I'm not going to do this procedure because I assume that they have lung disease that's not going to go away. And so what we're really showing here is that it's likely that the reason why they're not generating a large stroke volume across their valve is because their RV isn't compensating. Why that is, we don't quite know, but the whole system is kind of in a, no, a low flow state, so it's very hard to get high pressure gradients. Uh, at the same time, it doesn't appear that the lungs are the main culprit either, right? So the lungs seem fairly, fairly well, uh, you know, at least they're not different amongst the different groups that we evaluated here in aortic stenosis. So we're starting to now get kind of this multi-factorial uh, uh, approach where we can look at the left ventricle, we can look at the right ventricle, uh, as well as the lungs and treat them really as, as a system. So what's nice about this uh, uh, study was that all of these patients get the CT scan anyways, because they're trying to figure out what size valve you need to put into the patient. And so if you're figuring out which catheter you want to put into someone, you have to make that determination ahead of time. So you have to pull off the shelf a 26 millimeter valve or a 30 millimeter valve. And the way to size it is to use this CT scan. So we didn't really have to you know, get additional imaging. This was all already done in, in these patients. Um, but no one really uh, looks at the right ventricle uh, currently in the clinical practice. Um, another group of patients that we are interested in was people who are getting what's called a left ventricular assist device. So it's shown here on the left. So this is essentially an alternative to getting a heart transplant. Whether you're uh, ineligible for a heart transplant or you're waiting for one, you can put in this pump that will suck blood out of your left ventricle and pump it into the aorta for you. Uh, and so you wear this battery pack and, and essentially you become tethered to this. And one unfortunate uh, event that can occur is that you fix what's called you know, the left heart failure here by putting this in. But within a week or two weeks, you could have acute RV failure. Um, and so you're back in the hospital either getting what's uh, here on the right-hand side, an unplanned biventricular uh, VAD support. So they put in another device. And you can see that the outcomes here, the survival is way worse if they had to do that kind of unexpectedly versus if they planned to do it versus if you really only needed an LVAD. Uh, and so depending on you know, the severity of your acute RV failure, the mortality uh, gets significantly worse. And so again, this is the same type of challenge. You know the person has heart failure in front of you from the left side. They may have had an ischemia. They may have had some other cardiomyopathy. But now you're going to try to re relieve that, and it's basically a 40% chance that they end up going into RV failure of some sort after the procedure. And so can you pick those people off ahead of time so that you can tailor their treatment? Can you counsel them and really push maybe more aggressively for the heart transplant where everything gets replaced? Uh, same thing, for example, with heart-lung transplants. You wouldn't want to replace the heart if you also have to replace the lungs because you're not going to really solve the problem by, by only doing uh, one of the organ systems. So, you know, you all are becoming now amateur uh, cardiac radiologists by this point. Um, again, this is, now this is one of these patients that we imaged. It, you know, I promise the heart here is beating on the left. The left ventricle donut is not really moving very much, and that's kind of a hallmark of, of having left ventricular uh, heart failure. And the question now is, you know, what, do we, what do we, can we tell again about the right ventricle? Um, I love showing this picture because it, it, it's a really sick patient. And so if you think about other ways that you could image these patients, this person has uh, pacing leads here, which are these bright... Uh, dots that you see in the left ventricle, in the right ventricle, excuse me, they also have what's called an intraaortic balloon pump. If you look here in the aorta, there's this balloon that fills with air in synchrony essentially with your heartbeat. And the point is that it helps push the blood forward once it's in your aorta. And so this person is never going to get a cardiac MR. You're probably going to get fairly poor limb image quality with an echo. And so really it kind of highlights the robustness of CT in the sense that we can get really high quality pictures, you know, even at any stage in terms of someone being ill. In fact, our biggest challenge is getting normals, right? Uh, when do you ever get a CT scan with iodine if you're normal? It's usually kind of an accident, right? Or, or if you do, you still had to get referred to the scan, even if everything looks normal. So it's not quite a true, you know, person off the street normal value. So work that Anderson Scott did, which is a PhD student in bioengineering, was, was looking at 
what information can we glean from these, uh, from these studies? And so maybe unsurprisingly, he showed that the volumes that you get with RV uh, CT predict people who's going to have RV dysfunction after the LVAD better than you would with ECHO, which are the kind of dots shown on the ROC curve on the left. Uh, and then he also went one step further, and these patients also get right heart caths as part of their workup. That's a hallmark of cardiology is to figure out what the pressures are. And so what he built was these kind of hybrid pressure volume loops, uh, which shown on in the second panel, where you actually synchronize the CT volume you get with the pressure waveform. And you can start to get energetics of the right ventricular uh, performance. So what is the stroke work index that the heart does? And the clinical approach is to make an approximation when you do a catheterization, where you assume the, the loop is a rectangle, and you measure basically its height as one parameter and its width based on the cardiac output. And what he showed basically is that's a pretty gross underestimation of the performance. Um, and in fact, if you kind of correct for that using the CT scan, you start to see significant differences between those who go on to get RV failure and those who don't. And so obviously, there's a reason why you do the approximation clinically. It's easy. It's in the cath lab. You don't have to synthesize all of this information together. But you know, if you're trying to avoid this kind of return to the ICU, an emergent surgery at the end of the day, I, I think this is a fairly um, kind of low-hanging fruit to, to do. Um, again, I would say the CT scans here, everyone gets a CT scan before you get an LVAD. They're trying to figure out where does it fit in your chest cavity? You know, can you physically fit this device and, and where do you put it? So you're getting a CT scan. The only change we had to make in this case was getting such that we had the whole cardiac cycle moving. Uh, usually you would just get one phase to see kind of what your anatomy looks like, but you're not interested in, in, the, in the movie. But what was nice is they were already going to the scanner. That part is already worked up. We just had to um, modify what happened when you got to the, to the machine. Any questions? I know this is maybe too fast, too slow, early in the morning. Yeah, that was, you know, some of this is, is an issue of, of having kind of fairly low rates of some of these things and the study being kind of small. But right, whether, you know, why would, if these both are predictive, why, for example, the stroke volume or the ejection fraction wasn't predictive is, is an interesting question. Um, the fact that, you know, I think the curves, I would say is that they're probably not significantly different. You know, if the, the AOC of, of these two numbers, given the study size, is not uh, realistically uh, different. It is better than some of the other cath measurements and everything, and they're not shown on this graph. Uh, but the difference between whether EDV, EDVI or ESVI is, is more significant, we, we, we didn't really show. Um, but, but they do obviously go in tandem um, in terms of uh, th they're correlated. Yeah. Yeah, it's not that you can't. Uh, it's just a harder IRB to write. Uh, so if I want to say, for example, get an MRI scan on you, I can say to the IRB, well, it's a safe device. There's no harm done other than you giving you know, up an hour of your time and any risk of, let's say, an oxygen tank flying into the scanner or something like that. Um, that's the main risk of the scan. Um, actually, there's one more. It's the fact that we might find something that you had no reason of, of knowing about. So what's called an incidental loma. So what if I find something in your heart that I'm not a cardiac radiologist, I'm not someone who's doing a scan literally kind of according to clinical protocols, I'm doing something crazy. What do I, do I tell you? Do I tell your doctor? That's kind of another part that you have to work up. Um, but so that's essentially what you have to do in kind of ultrasound or, or MRI where there's no harm. If I do a CT scan, I'm exposing you to ionizing radiation, right? And it's much lower than I think people typically think. At these scans now are essentially the same amount that you would get in one year walking around San Diego. So that background radiation is like two to three millisieverts and that's essentially what we're scanning with now. So it is much lower than what it used to be, which, you know, if you watch like Chernobyl or any kind of these things that you don't want to obviously get exposed to incredibly high rates of radiation, uh, but it is still a risk. And so you don't want to subject that to people uh, normally. So you have to just consent them. Um, and it's a bit more uh, laborious. Yeah. But there's a lot of cases where people think you had it or they're getting it as part of just checking to make sure everything's okay before you get, let's say, um, you know, the classic thing is if you're of a certain age, and you have to get a surgery, they often want to know whether you have coronary disease before they put you in the table. And there's no reason that they think you have coronary disease other than you're like above 50 years old or 40 years old. And the surgeons for your foot just don't want to run the risk. And so you might get a CT scan for that purpose. And in that case, that's essentially, you know, it might come out normal, but you're still getting foot surgery, right? You're, you're still of a certain age. It's not a pure uh, normal person where we kind of advertise, 
you know, in the hallway and, and get people to walk in. Uh, so that's a, a slight difference, but we've made use of that data. Yeah. Okay, great. So the, the second uh, part, or uh, kind of final part of the talk here, is something that I think, you know, I, I'm always remiss if I don't include, uh, especially here at UC San Diego. So there's this disease type of uh, pulmonary hypertension called CTEF. So this is called chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Uh, basically what it means, I mean, the pathophysiology is a bit unclear whether you create clots in your lungs that turn into uh, scar tissue or clots, let's say, migrate from a DVT into your lungs and then over time turn into scar tissue. Uh, the genesis of them is, is maybe not as important as the fact that UCSD pioneered in the 70s a surgery to surgically remove that clot material. So that's what's shown here on the, on the left. So this is called the pulmonary thromboendarterectomy. So you basically have to cool the patient down, do complete circulatory arrest, and then you have basically like 20 minutes at a time to do one lung, and then you recirculate some blood, and then you do the other lung. So it's an incredibly complex surgical procedure. Uh, UCSD kind of led the way developing it, has taught essentially everyone else on earth how to do it, and still does more than any other center, uh, and, and has kind of a long history with the best surgical results. And so this is a, a fascinating uh, condition from an imaging perspective. You have these regional pockets of, of, of perfusion deficits. You cause a huge load on the right ventricle, and that's what you would die from if it's untreated is right ventricular failure. Uh, and now there's a new budding generation of both medications, as well as minimally invasive procedures, which is what's shown on the right, where you can go in with a catheter now and try to break up what are these kind of web-like scar tissue patterns, right? And so you can think of these two things as doing two very different things. In one case, you're removing you know, if you think about your plumbing, you're removing whatever's obstructing it. You're probably taking some of the intima with it. You might be changing the compliance of the pulmonary vasculature. Uh, you also happen to have this huge sternotomy. You have to recover from the surgery. So it's not without its uh, uh, drawbacks. On the right-hand side, you're not removing anything. You're kind of opening, pushing these ca uh, balloon catheters up such that you hope that you break the webs or the scar tissue without popping the blood vessel. Right? And it now becomes a serial process. You have to do each vessel area repeatedly uh, over many sessions. And so there's a lot of questions, right? Which procedure should you get? How many, which vessels should you target on the right-hand side? When do you stop? Uh, and because it's this parallel circuit, you may not see overall results in terms of the pressures immediately just by opening one area or the other. Uh, so, you know, again, this is my, if you look at the Wikipedia entry for this, that's at the top, it, you know, the history and development of this. Uh, kind of highlights the, the role UCSD played. Uh, and so, you know, we hit, I think, our 4,000th procedure a couple years ago now, uh, and we're still doing over or 200 a year, which, which is interesting because it's also then changed over time. As other centers have popped up, UCSD continues to get the more challenging cases. So in some ways, you know, if you go to the surgeon, they're kind of grumbling because the easy cases have now disappeared, right? They're being treated by other centers, which is kind of what you'd want. Uh, but now they're kind of pushing the envelope even further on, on whether people have comorbidities, they have even further disease. If you think about the pulmonary blood vessels, the further and further away you are, the harder it is to, to peel away or take out these, these clots. And so from an imaging perspective, it's relied primarily on, on these two methods. So the first one is it's an invasive pulmonary angiogram on the left. So here you move a catheter all the way into the lungs and then you shoot some dye. And you can see this is a 2D projection of the lung vasculature. The area is that you would hopefully have this thing blush entirely. It'd be a nice big pattern of of blood vessels, all the capillary beds would also turn gray. And so there's areas here, they nicely come with white arrows in this picture, uh, showing you kind of where the blood vessels are not uh, kind of normal and, and what you would expect. So the absence of vessels, there's sometimes they're pinched off. And so this is the anatomical imaging on the left. And the functional imaging is often what's called VQ imaging or, or scintigraphy imaging, where you both get an air scan of where someone's lungs look like, airway wise, and then you match it to where the blood goes. And so you're looking for areas where there is air but no blood, right? Suggesting that the airways are fine, but the blood vessels are, are impaired. And so again, the white arrows point out where there's some perfusion deficits here. And this is what you would basically try to do to diagnose and then also determine whether its surgery is, is worthwhile in these patients. So there's some limitations. A lot of these images are projections, so you don't really have true depth information. You're trying to rotate in your head where the perfusion deficits are. And you're not really comparing the anatomical blockage to the downstream perfusion, right? That's two different scans taken at maybe two different time points. And how would you correlate, for example, this arrow to this perfusion deficit it is not quite as, as, as easy as, as we would hope. So work done by one of the MD-PhD students in the lab has been trying to take advantage of a, a new CT modality where you 
image with a couple different or two different energies, and it allows you to decompose the tissue into its actual components. So is it water? Is it iodine? Is it calcium? You can start to now make a map. And in this case, what we're highlighting is the iodine. So by highlighting the iodine by itself on the right, we can then extract just the lung components of this, and it looks kind of what's shown here on the bottom left. Uh, so we did this using an AI segmentation, which figures out the lung lobes, which is really nice to, to automate the process. And so now once you have the lung perfusion here, we can try to quantify it or, or render it. And here we came up a rendering where the blue shows areas that have essentially no perfusion. Uh, so then you can also quantify how much of this bottom left lobe or, or, or uh, left upper lobe is, is hyperperfused. And so here we're coming up with maps of, of percentage of the lung that's impaired. So the first kind of check is, does this agree with what the radiologist says, right? They're really highly trained neural networks that over time have learned uh, patterns. And so here, the grading that they gave for whether a lobe is not impaired, minimally, mild, moderately, severely, or completely impaired kind of agrees with our quantification. So that was a nice sanity check. Uh, we also did this with a second reader who was less experienced, and so there's reasons why I'm only showing reader one, uh, not to, to kind of uh, uh, blame anybody here, uh, but there's, there's differences of opinion. Um, the other thing that's nice here is that we, because we have what happens after surgery, we actually have the surgical specimens that they removed from the patient. And so now we can go back and compare, do the areas that were impaired on the imaging before you had surgery match the areas that the surgeons removed these obstructive specimens. And so here I'm just showing two examples. The first one is a patient who has what's called bilateral lower lobe disease. In this case, the, there's clots on both sides, but primarily in the lower lobes. And that's actually where um, most of these are found. And the quantitative metrics here, the 8%, the 8%, 8%, 7 percent here match the fact that those are high areas of hyperperfusion. There's a lot of areas that you would, you would want to treat. Uh, it's a very different pattern than the second patient, which is, has a unilateral disease. So there's just clots in one side. Uh, and the reason that this is important is if you have clots on one side, they might be able to only do the surgery. Instead of doing a sternotomy, they might be able to go through your ribs and target that one area uh, only, right? At the same time, you really want to be sure that there's really only disease on one side, right? You're going to go through this procedure. Uh, you might as well get it done kind of right. Uh, I, I have heard of one person who was offered this minimally invasive approach and said, no, no, I want the full sternotomy, which is its own psychology in and of itself. Uh, but I think they just didn't want to be kind of a, a, a guinea pig. Um, but obviously, if you can spare someone the recovery of the sternotomy in terms of not being able to lift things, just the uh, uh, discomfort, it'd be great if you could really target these patients for a more minimally uh, invasive surgical procedure. And so our next steps are now really to look at smaller pockets and see if we can work with the people who are getting the catheter procedures and see do we see changes over time in those areas. If we could obviously image these people afterwards, that would be really nice to see the before and after. That is one unfortunate thing is because everyone flies here to get the surgery and then fly home. So we don't necessarily have as much long-term follow-up as, as other places. In the UK, it's one big integrated uh, center and so they are able to do much more long-term uh, evaluations. But um, we're, we're trying to figure out ways around that. So again, I'll come back to this and, and maybe I'll take, uh, happy to take any questions, although I think we're close on time. Um, but so I, hopefully that was a glimpse of, of the type of work we do where we're really targeting points in the surgical management of patients or clinical management of patients where we think there's a question that imaging can answer, right? And I'm, I'm the first to admit that there's plenty of things we can't answer, right? A lot of genomic tests and, and proteomic tests and blood markers are gonna be really useful. Uh, but if you want to measure where something is or, or the length of something or if it's been a change in the spatial composition of something, uh, usually that's a great uh, location for imaging to, to play a role. And so we've, uh, we've really kind of enjoyed it. And, 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 and again, I'll, I'll say thanks to the team and, and the funding sources uh, and happy to take any questions. No questions from the audience? Yeah, Marcus. Uh, so one question. When you um, talked about using kind of the multi-energy approach to look at the diffusion maps, um, can you talk a little bit more about how those kind of different technologies play in together to make the maps appear here? Yeah, sure. So uh, what the uh, principle we're taking advantage of is that different elements or tissues like iodine or water have different X-ray attenuations depending on the energy. And so even though two things might look bright at one energy, if you move to a different energy, there'll be different characteristics. And so the challenge here is that the scanner just shoots at two energies. And at both of those scans, it's actually a spectrum that you get. So it's basically a low energy spectra and then a high energy spectra. 
So it's not a perfect uh, separation as if you did it on a, on a benchtop scanner or kind of in a physics lab, I guess. Um, but it is kind of enough to, to separate out some of these materials. Uh, you have to pick basically basis functions that you want to evaluate. So you can do water versus iodine or water versus calcium. You can't do all of them necessarily. But there's new CT technology, which um, is called photon counting detectors. And the idea there is that you can actually count the incident photons that you detect and look at their energy. And so it actually allows you to make much more beautiful kind of color pictures of different elements. And so this kind of would, would benefit from that type of technology. And they're already commercially available. We just have to get one. Uh, but, but yeah, that's essentially the, the principle. Yeah. Awesome. Let's take the speaker one last. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Our next speaker is Professor Joe Schonenberg from the um, Department of Pharmacology and Chemistry and Biochemistry. Um, Professor Schonenberg is a Roger um, Chen Chancellor's faculty fellow, and before um, joining UC San Diego as a faculty member, he did a postdoc at um, UC Berkeley and then the Max Planck Institute of Biophysics. So without further ado, I'll give it over to Professor Schoenberg, while he gets set up. You have to use it for the recording, please. Oh. Thank you. Sure. Hello. Uh, I'm, very, I'm very happy to be here today. I'm super excited to be here today, too. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, 4D cell biology, um, which I believe is basically a revolution in what we're going to do in imaging and in cell biology uh, that is driven by completely new technology. Um, you, you see a tiny bit of the movie uh, that I'm going to show later in my background. Uh, we're going to get there. I'm super excited to be at the Interfaces uh, Symposium here um, because what, what we are doing in the lab is basically one big interface. Um, I'm just, uh, this is basically an overview of what we're doing in the lab. On one hand, we have basically the bottom-up uh, computational side of the lab where we basically do simulations of systems. We have like computer science where we build simulations. We have system parameters that we put into particle coordinates. We basically build uh, synthetic microscope uh, pictures. And on the other hand, we have basically these uh, imaging sites where we have these super advanced adaptive optics that are slide sheet microscopes where we then create um, these new movies. We use deep learning for segmentation uh, tracking particle coordinates and use basically deep learning as an interface between the two. So um, th that's an outline. So I'm going to give you a, an example of how that's how that's going to work. But first, let's talk about uh, let's talk about imaging. So we're going to be on the right hand side. So what I have here is uh, the standard way of how a, a lab does imaging today. So typically, you would have to answer your biological question. You would basically do 2D cell culture. You would grow your cells in a dish. Uh, you would do basically 2D imaging, may maybe plus minus time, and you create like data sets that are maybe hundreds of megabytes in size. 
And then you would do uh, semi-manual data analysis. You would like fantastic tools like Fiji. You can use them to um, basically draw our eyes on your, on your 2D microscope images. And then you have basically done your data analysis. Uh, in all three of these areas, we have these drastic technological advances. So in, in the first area, we have now the ability to basically grow 3D uh, organoids from stem cells. And so we are at the Sanford Consortium, um, you know, basically 60% of the labs are basically growing organoids from stem cells in this building. Um, super exciting. You, you basically can look at the cell, like this is a brain organoid that we grow in the lab. You can basically look at the individual cells uh, in those organoids in the tissue context. So you don't have to like uh, look at the artificial environment on a glass surface anymore. The problem is, until very recently, we didn't really actually have the means to image those organoids live. Um, that only came about when uh, Eric Betzig introduced lattice light sheet microscopy. Lattice light sheet microscopy is um, 100 times more benign than your normal confocal microscope that you get on, on campus. So that actually allows you to spend your photon budget in the time dimension and not just like fry the this, this sample. And so, so then what you're doing is you no longer actually image like one plane, but you actually s image 200 planes a second and you spend them on the volume uh, and then you basically create three terabytes of data per hour. And so if I give you a, a three terabyte data set, no, our data sets are typically 10 terabytes in size. If I give you a 10 terabyte data set, you're not gonna use your mouse. And, and draw our eyes on this, okay? So, so that's, that's just completely impossible. So you're going to need uh, high performance computing and machine learning uh, to actually analyze those data sets. And we are, we are actually, uh, with those machines, we are really pushing the boundaries of what's computationally possible. It used to be the X-ray crystallography people, uh, then it used to be the cryo-EM people that created the biggest data sets. Now it's, uh, it looks like it's, it's basically us. Okay, let me show you an example of how, how that looks like. So, um, if, you, if you think of, um, you know, you can basically create uh, brain cells, lung cells, and intestinal cells from stem cells. And then, like, typically, uh, they would all look pretty much similar, being extremely flat, almost like a sunny side up egg on a glass cover slip. Like when you, when you look at the C dimension of those cells, they actually really look like this. Um, for all of these systems, we have these organoid systems. You have brain organoids, lung organoids, intestinal organoids. And then uh, what I would like to, to focus on as, an, as this example is uh, mitochondrial dynamics. Because what, what we know actually is that mitochondria are actually a fantastic readout for disease. Um, healthy mitochondria form these three-dimensional networks in the cell. If you have uh, neurogenesis, uh, drug-resistant epilepsy, COVID-19, or Parkinson's disease, what happens is your mitochondrial network fragments in very specific ways. It always, fra it always fragments or does something different, but it's, it's always in a particular way. The interesting thing about this, so this is not at all what mitochondria look like, okay? So all the textbooks are basically wrong. If, if anybody who has a computer open right now and Google images like mitochondria, you're going to see potatoes like this. You're not, you're not, gonna, see, you're not gonna see actually what mitochondria look like, which is incredible to me. Um, when you look at mitochondria under a microscope, they actually look, well, closer to this, but actually not really like this. They basically form these really long three-dimensional structures in the cell um, and then when you take a movie of this, which I suggest you do, you see that they're actually incredibly dynamic. What is, what is happening? So this is basically a three-dimensional lattice light sheet movie of mitochondrial dynamics uh, at three seconds per frame. Uh, everything in white is mitochondrial density. What the cell is doing, it's basically doing local demand matching. When the cell needs energy over here, it takes mitochondria and puts it there. When the cell needs energy somewhere else, it takes mitochondria and puts them there. Um, also, uh, these mitochondrial networks, there's always fission and fusion going on in these, in these mitochondria uh, to basically take damaged mitochondria out of the system and add new mitochondria to the existing networks. So it's incredibly dynamic. So, so you basically need four-dimensional imaging to, to really grasp and understand mitochondria, really. 
and then basically make make use of this readout that we that we know exists but never could actually actually access but with this technology we can so yeah so how how can we access this readout um, this is basically um, 45 well, 50, 50 years of microscope development in one slide um, confocal microscopes have been around for about 35 years so every Every microscope on, on campus is uh, like that, uh, you know, the, the uh, facility microscopes are typically confocals. Um, Gaussian light sheets have also been around for about 35 years, but the, the resolution of Gaussian light sheets is not really high enough for what you want to do. Then we had Bessel light sheets around uh, 2010s. Um, and then what we have now, basically since four to five years, are adaptive optics lattice light sheet microscopes. So they are basically 100 times faster than confocal, 100 times less photo bleaching than confocal, and have these adaptive optic systems. Um, let me show you what that means. Confocal systems, they basically scan one pixel in your tissue. Okay, And so by scanning one pixel, what you need to essentially scan a volume, you have to scan this pixel around to form a line, then to form a sheet, and then to form the 3D volume. So that, that takes you a lot of time because you basically have to scan the piezo around to make that happen, okay? What it also does, it actually causes a lot of photo bleaching because the confocal takes its name from, you know, it's a confocal spot where the light goes all the way, you know, through the tissue and goes back into the, con into the same objective uh, to the detector. So you basically fry everything on the way to making the pixel and then you fry everything on the way back. So there's lots of light that you basically spend on damaging the tissue um, and, and not actually getting any read out of this. So, but it was basically the best thing we could do until, uh, until we had lattice light sheet microscopy. So lattice light sheet microscopy works like this. You basically s send a very thin sheet of light into your sample. And then what you have is you don't have to scan individual pixels around, but you can basically scan one plane at a time. So you only have to step that plane through the volume once. And then since this light sheet is extremely thin, um, like on the order of like, you know, five nanometers, um, you don't waste any light any, anywhere else in the tissue. So it's extremely, it's extremely benign to the tissue. So you don't bleach nearly as fast as a confocal. So this is lattice light sheet, this is your confocal. So basically when you have like 20 stacks, confocal's already gone, uh, we, can, we can keep imaging. Um, yeah, and then since you can keep imaging and since you can actually do volumetric imaging, uh, you have these massive data sets and three terabytes of data power. Okay, so that's, that's lattice light sheet microscopy. Um, the adaptive optics in lattice light sheet microscopy then allow you to go into deeper layers of the tissue. So if you image into a tissue, like say your hand, the reason your hand is not really uh, see-through is basically because of two things, scattering and its aberrations. Aberrations is what I have depicted here. So your, your wave front basically hits the tissue and gets, gets scrambled as it travels into the tissue. Uh, what you can do is you can use what the astronomers do. Uh, you can basically use um, systems where you capture um, these wavefront aberrations using a wavefront sensor. You can calculate the inverse of these wavefronts uh, and then put them onto your deformable mirror. And by, by having them on a deformable mirror, you can basically cancel those aberrations out. Uh, what I have here on this picture is a noise canceling headphone uh, that some people have probably used on airplanes or whatever. It's the same idea. Noise canceling headphones, they basically sense the ambient noise, put the anti-noise on your ear so that you can only listen to the music. We do the same thing with light. We sense what, how the light is aberrated. We put the, the difference on our deformable mirrors. And what you get is um, something that looks very terrible and basically not usable. Uh, and to transform that to a diffraction limited 200 nanometer uh, resolution uh, spot image. So that's, that's basically what you want. Okay, and then, so you cannot, you cannot buy these things. Okay, so, so what you do is you buy um, tens of thousands of components and then you assemble those microscopes. Um, we have basically one of, on the order of five micro operational microscopes like that on the planet. Um, it's, it's hard to build them, but it's worth it. 
Um, so let me show you what we can do. So this is, um, this is basically Jillian uh, in the lab uh, taking uh, IP, like stem cells and differentiate them into lung, intestine, and brain organoids. So those are then uh, live organoids. What we do is we actually put fluorescent tags into our stem cells so that um, you know, every cell that comes from the individual stem cell that has the fluorescent tags is fluorescent in the end, so that the entire organoid in the end is fluorescent. We can put it on a microscope and we immediately see data. Um, so then this is how that looks like. Um, this is just the very first frame uh, of our movie. Um, so this is the tissue. This is about half a millimeter, so 500 microns by 250 microns by 50 microns in depth. And then what I've done is I have uh, basically used machine learning um, to segment each of the cells in that volume. So I have two, uh, basically I have two labels. Okay? I have uh, red, which is the plasma membrane, and then I have green, which is uh, the mitochondria. So I use the plasma membrane label uh, to segment the cells. I use machine learning to do this. And then you can basically um, increase the distance computationally between all the cells and then uh, look at the tissue contribution, like constitution, how it actually looks like. Uh, but these are movies, okay? So, um, so this is actually the data that comes from the microscopes. This is um, about five seconds per volumetric frame. Um, so you basically see that all the mitochondria are extremely dynamic. Um, what you have here is basically a, a Z, uh, see-through through the uh, through the individual uh, cells. And then what we can do, since since we have the segmentation of the tissue, um, we can basically go ahead and like pick individual cells that we're interested in, like epithelial cells or other cells that we're interested in, and look at the mitochondrial dynamics in those specific cells. So this is basically 260 cells that we image simultaneously and can then really, on a tissue scale, um, learn something about uh, mitochondria and the tissue. Okay, so the, the movies are fantastic, but uh, there's a big data analysis problem. Okay, so this is basically what, what previous microscopy technology are. So they basically create like one gigabyte per hour there are tons of visualization tools. Uh, there are tons of tools where you can analyze those data sets. It's often thin manual. Um, you are not going to manually analyze your three terabytes of data per hour. So um, for the longest time, we didn't even have means to actually visualize our data because it's so big. Um, now we actually do. Uh, and so now we are in the game of basically developing these high performance computing and machine learning tools. That's basically what one third of the lab does uh, one third of the lab is um, sample generation, so stem cell derived uh, organoid tissues. Uh, another third of the lab is advanced optics, and another third of the lab is uh, high performance computing and machine learning. Okay, so when you look at these mitochondrial networks, so this is like, say, one frame, one block of mitochondria data in our lattice light sheet microscopy data. So what you see is when you look at the mitochondrial skeleton, so um, this is basically when you reduce the mitochondria density to just uh, one line, then what you see is then from zero seconds to 3.2 seconds, it does move, but it doesn't move too much. Okay, so like as, as a human, you can basically say, okay, this, this blue line is basically going here, you know, this guy is going here. So, so you can basically, you have hope of, of tracking this over time. Okay, and so that's, that's basically what we want to do. We want to track the mitochondrial network over time. And th the way to do this, and you can ask me later how this, how this really works, this is the work from uh, Zach, who is a fantastic algorithm developer in the lab. Um, you basically use uh, the distance of how far the mitochondria have moved from one step to the next time step, and you use something that, that we call topology cost, which is um, does the mitochondrial network at that particular point look very similar um, to what you would match it to in the next time step? And then you use, what would you do since you basically solve a, a linear assignment problem, which is um, a mathematical way to basically find the optimal solution for, um, for an assignment optimization problem. And then you have the problem of, okay, once, once you have you know, decided that this is the problem you want to solve, you have to somehow figure out a way to generate test data for this. 
Because like, how, how are you going to tell if your tracking algorithm is actually going to do a good job versus you're just fooling yourself? And so that's when, uh, when our particle simulations come into play. So this is basically um, what we've developed uh, or what, what I developed in my grad school. So this is basically a reaction diffusion simulator. Like some, some people might know molecular dynamic simulations. I developed molecular dynamic simulations for uh, larger scales, so it's basically reaction diffusion simulations, and you can simulate uh, all kinds of systems like uh, clathrin, uh, immediate endocytosis, or actin skeletons, or microtubules. But we basically use this for uh, in silico mitochondria simulations. And so these in silico mitochondria simulations, what we do is we basically give them um, the parameters that we get from our microscope data. So it's basically the structure of the mitochondria, how dense they are, how fast they move. And so from this in silico data, we can basically create artificial microscope data. And since, since we know like where each bead travels over time, we can basically test our tracking algorithm in this in silico data and we really convince ourselves that this works. So this is when you just use the distance term. So this is tracking precision over how fast things are moving. So if you just use the distance term, which is what most tracking algorithms do, then you get like a very, very poor tracking performance. If you use the distance plus topology, basically what, what uniquely is, is the mitochondrial network that basically has this topology, then we are doing actually very, very well if we don't allow fission and fusion events. If we do allow fission and fusion events, which basically mitochondria do, then we are still actually uh, doing quite a good job in the regime where we want to be. So this is basically the regime that we can access uh, with the lattice slide sheet. And so as a summary, what we can do, we can basically calculate all these like black arrows here between the mitochondrial uh, network fragments, the mitochondrial network skeletons from one frame to the next. And so this is the, the first three-dimensional mitochondrial network tracker um, you know, ever. And so um, again, so this is basically uh, lattice light sheet data. This is uh, one cell that we segment using machine learning. Then we um, uh, have basically the time lapse of the mitochondria. We can segment those mitochondria um, you know, from the data. So that's basically how that looks like. Then you can skeletonize those mitochondria, these um, uh, backbones. And then you can calculate with the methods that I just uh, told you, calculate uh, how the mitochondrial network moves over time. Um, great. And so then what we can now do, yeah, this, looks a little, this looks a little bit stretched, I'm sorry, this, this should basically be like a little bit wider. But so what we, what we see is that lung cells and intestinal cells have, have just completely different three-dimensional morphology of mitochondrial networks and, and uh, organelles. So your intestinal cells basically have like these very dense uh, mitochondrial networks that are everywhere. Uh, these lung epithelial cells, uh, they just have these incredibly long <coughs> stretches of mitochondria. So it's, it's very interesting just, just by, by looking at them, <coughs> we see these, these big changes um, where we can already classify Blindly, we could basically say, okay, this has to be a brain cell, this has to be an intestinal cell, this has to be a lung cell. And so when we then look at uh, these network parameters that we can get out of the mitochondrial uh, analysis, so there's, for example, uh, you can look at this, if, if these mitochondrial networks are sparse or dense, so it looks like uh, the brain uh, cell networks seem to be significantly denser than all the other networks that we look at. Also looks like um, that the uh, efficiency of these mitochondrial networks in brain cells seem to be much, much more effective um, than the other cell types. And then when we look at the motility of how fast <coughs> the mitochondria are moving, um, then it's interesting, uh, the lung mitochondria, they basically seem to be very, very fast and the brain mitochondria seem to be very, very slow. And so this is basically just the very, very beginning of us analyzing this, this entirely new space um, of organelle dynamics and cell biology that has never really been accessible before. Okay, and so that's, that's basically, um, you know, how we, how we use basically interfaces in the lab. So on one hand, we have 
uh, the, the computational part in the simulations. On the other hand, we have basically the imaging where we um, you know, get the parameters for the simulations and for, for the simulations we basically uh, we inform uh, tracking and other things that we do here and we use deep learning uh, in between. And then I just want to give you an outlook uh, of, of what's going to come next. So the scopes create three terabytes per hour. Uh, we have tools for the deconvolution and all the uh, pre-processing. Particle tracking is basically my postdoc work. So if you want to track vesicles, if you want to track drugs, if you want to track all that kind of stuff in, three, in these 4D movies, that's basically solved. If you want to if you want to track organelles or three-dimensional networks in these 4D data sets, like mitochondria, antroplasmic reticulum, uh, microtubules, or actin networks, then that's, we, are, we are getting there to having that solved. But there's also uh, membrane tracking, nuclei tracking, novel biology, and, and all kinds of things that really need to be developed next. And so I basically want to, you know, we, we have to really build this new infrastructure for microscopy because we now have have this technology. So I'm just going to show you um, how that's going to look like. So this is basically a, a movie of uh, a zebrafish muscle tissue where, uh, again, uh, we used uh, machine learning to segment the tissue um, to into the individual cells. And what you see here, these are clathrin and endocytosis particles. So this is uh, all the clathrin vesicles on the surfaces of these particles. And so these are movies again, so you can basically see how all of these individual clathrin vesicles are being formed on these plasma membranes and, and what they're doing. So, so you can basically learn so much about like in situ tissue, um, you know, endocytosis, exocytosis, um, your system of choice. And this is also, this is not my data, but this is data from that same scope. Um, this is the, the earliest stages of, of cancer metastasis formation. So what you hear, have here in purple, those are capillaries. And what you have here in green, that's, that's a cancer cell. So that's a 3D movie of a cancer cell basically making its way through these capillaries and trying to find weak spots in those capillaries to, to form a metastasis. And so then this is um, one of the first 3D movies of one of these cancer cells actually having found one of those weak spots and making its way out of the blood vessel into the tissue and forming a metastasis right there. And so there's so much going on that we have access to now that we, that we basically need you know, to, to all come together in the field um, and, and produce the tools and means to actually make this possible to, to get uh, the quantitative readouts that, that we need to basically uh, find new therapies and new drugs. And then so this is um, super cool. So this is basically a zebrafish, live zebrafish movie. It's also not my data, but it's uh, from the same scope. So this is the outside of the fish. Uh, this is the skin of the fish. This is the inside of the fish. This is a lymphatic vessel. And then, so um, what you have here in blue are small dextrin particles. And what you have in orange is basically every plasma membrane of the fish. Okay, and so then what you see here in like these, these little fellows here that come into the lymphatic vessel and go back into the tissue again, those are white cells that are basically, you know, like gobbling up these little dextrin particles here. And see, that is actually what, what cell biology and what biology looks like um, on the like nanometer and micrometer scale live. And so I'm, I'm just I incredibly fascinated by this. I think this is basically going to rewrite all our textbooks because if, if you can wish for a microscopy, if, if you, like we are 3D beings that live through time, what you need is 3D movies to understand that situation. And we have that now. So yeah, that's basically what I wanted to tell you. Uh, we are rapidly moving from 2D cell culture, 2D imaging and data analysis to 3D organoid culture for the imaging of those organoids and big data analysis. And with that, um, I would basically like to, to thank the team, which is absolutely incredible. Uh, you can go on Twitter where we have some, some of our updates. Um, we have uh, all our software on GitHub, it's open source. Um, I would like to thank all these uh, nice people for funding and we have openings uh, for postdocs, lab managers, if you wanna rotate. We basically need, need people to help to make this happen.
thank you very much for having me. And uh, I'm very happy to answer any questions. This one? Yeah. So for, for this one, what, what we basically want is some kind of like ground truth that we can compare our tracking algorithm to. And, and so for this one, we basically, we went into the data and we said, okay, this is basically how long our mitochondria are. This is basically how fast we see they are moving. And this is basically how, how fast we see they are fission and fissioning and fusing. And so then, yeah, you basically build um, this reaction to fusion dynamics that, that mimics what we see in the real data. And then once, once you have this, um, you have essentially full control over, over every time step there, which, which you don't, right? Like in, in, the, in the real experimental data, there, there's like experimental noise, there, there's also like, maybe the microscope didn't work that well on that particular day, or your segmentation thresholding didn't work for whatever reason. So you don't necessarily know if what you're looking at is exactly what you expect it to be. So you have to like do lots of controls for this. Here, you know exactly where each piece of the mitochondrial network is for every time step. And so then when you then let the tracking algorithm run on this, you can very, very well say, okay, the tracking algorithm got this particle right, this particle right, this this one totally messed up, you know. So that's that's basically the the, the idea there, you know. Uh, and it's, it's basically, it's it's our way around the problem that we have these massive data sets, you know. Like typically, what you would do for microscopy data, you would basically have your graduate students or like an army of undergrads that basically like goes manually through your data and creates expert curated ground truth, you know, where you say, okay, this is, this is a nucleus, this is a nucleus, or like, this is a mitochondrion, this is a mitochondrion, and then you compare that ground truth from, from human experts to what the algorithm does. But it's, it, uh, you know, there's no way we can, we can manually create do those, those data sets. It's just too big, it's just too crazy. So, so we simulate it. Fundamentally, we feel a lot, not logically correct. Um, we actually have to know 
what it is you're looking for, uh, you have to understand what, what you saw tells you about um, the condition of the patient. And then you need to know the mechanism of the disease that it tells you about so you can treat them. So machine learning will not cure cancer, but it will help us, but we have to use all the evidence like we already know about cancer or heart disease. So um, I really think this um, beautiful example I'm going to invite the next speaker up to get set up while we continue with questions, but yeah, Professor Rainier. Yes. Yes. Um, people have done that. So, so they basically all they all sit on microtubules, and they basically all are shuttled around using molecular motors on those microtubules. Um, there's also they can also be propelled by actin cytoskeleton, almost like little actin comets, uh, which happens uh, a lot during uh, cell division when you have basically removed all your microtubules, and you still need to shuttle mitochondria around. Um, so those are the, the main means of, of transport for this. Basically passengers. They, you, can, you can think of that way, yeah. Basic, basically passengers, yeah. Yeah, it's, the, the interesting thing is what, um, what you always have to keep in mind is I have only the label on mitochondria, but the ER is co basically connected to all the mitochondria all the time. All the fission and fusion events basically happen where there is a mitochondria ER contact site. Um, they sit on the cytoskeleton. So it's all interconnected, you know. Um, and so I think that that's basically what we're going to have to do next, you know, like to, to integrate all of these into the picture, to, to really understand cell biology as it, as it is in, in three dimensions and how they all interact with each other. It's a good question. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. I hate to end the conversation short, but in the name of time, I want to keep things moving along. Let's thank our speaker one more time. Joseph, do you want to? Okay. And without further ado, I'll introduce our next speaker, um, Professor Gudla from the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. Thanks uh, for the introduction and for the invitation. It's great to be back. Um, in fact, one of my very first graduate students ten, about 10 years ago was part of the interface program. And so I know how great this program is. It's so nice to see it going strong after so many years still. Um, and I've been fascinated by both talks and, and the power of imaging techniques and how much new biology you can discover if you can probe systems in new ways. And my lab focuses on an interface, biological interface, that has so far resisted imaging techniques. And in fact, it has resisted a lot of tools uh, that are available to study biology. And so a lot of it is still unknown. Um, and the interface is called glyco the glycocalyx. And I wonder, how many of you have heard the term the glycocalyx? How many of you are then familiar with the functions of the glycocalyx and how it works and, and the fundamentals? Oh. OK, I see two hands, maybe three hands. Great, yeah, so um, it is one of, the, one of the reasons for not really knowing much about that interface is, is the lack of tools to study it. So let's talk a little bit about the glycocalyx first. So the glycocalyx is, is the interface that covers the cell surface, um, or basically the surface of every single cell on this planet. There's no organism that would have evolved to not have a glycocalyx covering the cell surface. And the glycocalyx is really a, an ensemble of glycoproteins and glycolipids, which are biomolecules that contain sugars. And these sugars that we typically refer to as glycans these days um, are introduced into proteins as post-translational modifications uh, in the ER and the Golgi. And, and because 
the glycans are not templated by the genome. Right? They tend to be, and they just sort of stand away or apart from, from the molecular biology uh, realm. And, and so this is where chemists like me come in play, uh, and because this is a really good opportunity for us to, to develop new tools to study uh, these particular structures. It is a rather significant interface. So what I'm showing here is one image, most recent image, of, of the glycocalyx on an epithelial cell. So this is the epithelial cell here, and this is the glycocalyx. And that glycocalyx can span tens to hundreds of nanometers, even to microns, such as shown here. And this is the mucosal glycocalyx. So all of our epithelial cells will be covered with a glycocalyx that looks like this. And these individual, you know, barely cooked spaghetti are proteins called mucins. And mucins get their name because they've been isolated from mucus, and hence my title. And I don't have nice images of mucins, so, uh, uh, because they're very difficult to image. This is really one of the most up-to-date uh, up pictures of mucins. And so I'll use cartoons. So this is, this is a mucin. It's a, it's a really large glycoprotein. It could be membrane-associated as part of the glycocalyx, or it could be secreted. And what gives it this unique shape is the, um, the presence of these uh, large numbers of copies of glycans. So I'm using these little circles and squares um, to represent the individual building blocks of, of the glycan, and the glycans are then attached to the core protein. And because there's so many of these glycans, and because they're large, they force the protein into an extended rod-like conformation that gives the glycocalyx its unique shape. And it's believed to be providing a physical barrier at the epithelium. But it also provides lubrication because of the properties of the glycans. It also uh, mediates the transport of nutrients and gas. And it also serves, potentially, as the entry point for pathogens. And so this is something that we study in my lab. Now you can see that these structures are kind of diverse just by looking at them. Uh, remember that every single one of these charms our charm pieces represent a, a chemical structure. And so there's a great diversity of chemical structures, uh, and they, those define the interactions with, with proteins on pathogens. But it's not just the structure of the glycan, but it's also its presentation that's really important in this context. Why is that? Well, the dirty secret of glycobiology is that the interactions between individual glycans and proteins that recognize them, uh, they're generally called lectins, are relatively weak. They're specific, but they're weak. So when you think about an interaction of a, of a, of a lectin that might have one binding site for a sugar, um, you would measure something that's on the, on the order of 100 micromolar. So that's not really very strong interaction in the biological context. And so the way biology overcomes it is through multivalency. You can have multiple copies of this glycan, and it could be mirrored in the oligomeric state of the lectin. So the lectin can have two binding sites for a glycan, and you can have two glycans on the protein. And when, when those two interactions occur at the same time, now what you will measure is the product of these microscopic affinity comp uh, constants. Right? So this is, this is affinity, and this is now avidity. And you can go from 100 micromolar to 10, to, to 10 nanomolar, which is actually quite significant. And this is called the face-to-face -face interaction when, when you have two interactions occurring at the same time between the lectins and the and the, and the glycoprotein. Well, although this is kind of logical, this type of interaction doesn't really occur very often. There's another way that nature can achieve strong interactions with glycans through multivalency, and it's called the bind and slide model. And in this case, you still have an oligomeric lectin, but it engages only one glycan on the protein, because maybe the, the geometry of presentation of the other one is not proper, and so it cannot interact in face-to-face -face mode. And so you will have a weak interaction and then potential dissociation of the, of the lectin. But because you have multiple copies of the glycan nearby, you have very high local concentration, so the lectin keeps rebinding. Right? And then how long that lectin st stays associated with the glycoprotein will depend on how many glycan copies you have on the protein, how, how far apart they are, how flexible the protein is, right? So, so this, is, this is a way for nature to tune that interaction. So this you can think of, of, of a digital type of interaction. You have a weak interaction or, or a strong one. 
monovalent, divalent, phase to phase. But here, this is more of an analog control of you know, sort of tuning up and down the interaction. What also helps is that it leaves this additional site open, and so you can bridge across. You can potentially bind to two glycoproteins on the cell surface. Okay, so, so the, these are the two different modes, and that really complicates the biology of glycans. But it also gives biology a lot of opportunity to tune these interactions. And because of this binding mode, or the presentation here, the, the organization of individual glycans in the nanos, at the nanoscale in the protein matters. So we cannot study glycans just, just as individual structures and how they interact with proteins, but rather we need to consider the entirety of the glycocalyx, its dimensions, nanoscale dimensions, complexity, but also dynamics. And this is something that my lab focuses on, uh, developing tools to probe these aspects of the glycocalyx. And because we are chemists, we take a completely chemical approach and we remove the protein from the glycoprotein and replace, the, replace it with a macromolecule that we can synthesize with good control of its structures uh, and nanoscale organization and features. So what do we do? This is the general tool that we use, or one of them. We generate synthetic scaffolds, and then we borrow these glycans from, from biological systems, the glycans that we want to study. We merge them together chemically into what we call neoglycoproteins or neoglycoconjugates, mucinomimetic, as, uh, if I may. And, and, and we can control how many and what type of sugars we attach, how we space them, how long that mucinomimetic is, and so on. And because these are chemical structures, we can also introduce a variety of function and functional groups. So anchors, we can integrate these materials with analytical platforms to measure how proteins interact with them. But we can also introduce them into cell membranes by, basically, by simply adding a lipid at the end of the molecule. And we teach organic chemistry students, or general chemistry students really, like dissolves like, and so the hydrophobic lipid will force and drive this neoglycoprotein into the membrane of the cell to augment the natural uh, glycocalyx and to build the glycocalyx that we want and study its interactions. Okay, so I want to demonstrate how we do this and what it allows us to investigate on a, on a topic that involves pathogen interactions. So many pathogens have to overcome the mucosal barrier, the mucins, to get entry into the cell. And one of the quintessential viruses is influenza A. Remember influenza A? We've been talking a lot about SARS-CoV-2, which, by the way, also needs a glycan to get into the cell. But influenza A is a quintessential one because it has basically, it's got three proteins in its, in its envelope, and two of them interact with, with a glycan, which is called sialic acid. And the H in H1N1 stands for hemagglutinin, and the hemagglutinin recognizes this terminal modification on a sugar receptor called sialic acid. The N, and so this is, this is how the virus grabs onto the cell surface to get in. The N in the H1N1 is neuraminidase, and it's an enzyme that cleaves this glycan from the sugar. And it needs this neuraminidase to, get, uh, to leave the cell after it replicates so that it can go and infect another cell. Here you see an image of an epithelial cell that's infected by, with H1N1, and it was treated with Tamiflu. And Tamiflu is an inhibitor of this neuraminidase. And you can see that these viruses are trapped on the cell surface, and they can't escape. And that's how Tamiflu works. Okay. Now, the recognition of these structures also defies, defines the host specificity range of the virus. So avian flus, uh, avian viruses, recognize salic acid that's connected in this orientation. Okay? And this, this type of glycan is found in the guts of birds, which is the natural reservoir of influenza. In order to change and infect humans, the virus needs to mutate its hemagglutinin to grab onto this structure. And you will find this structure populating the cell surfaces of our um, uh, lung epithelia. Okay, so that the virus needs to evolve 
its, its specificity to switch from, from disk glycan to acquire ability to bind to disk glycan. And that's how novel viruses will emerge in the influenza family. What we are interested in knowing is what's really important in terms of the infection cycle. We know that sialic acids are important. We know that the linkages are important. But mucins, which are the dominant part of the glycocalyx, they're decorated with these sialic acids. So our understanding of the mucosal barrier and the mucosal glycocalyx as being a barrier might be flawed. The virus you know, could potentially take advantage of all of these sialic acids on our mucins. So how do these mucins really help prevent infection? Could this be a mistake in evolution that we evolved these molecules that, that don't really, as protective molecules that really don't protect? Okay, so we started to ask this question. And first what we wanted to do is to see what happens if you take these sugars, either this one or this one, these glycans, and you organize them in a mucid-like format. What happens to viral binding? So we generated our uh, a mucin mimetic polymer where we attached these two sugars. So this is the prototype of the avian receptor and this is the prototype of the human one. And then what we varied was the length of the, of the mucin mimetic, hence the number of sugar copies that we attach to the, to the structure. And then we used a simple assay, hemagglutination assay, where we take red blood cells, and red blood cells have sialic acids and they could be Plus, they could be agglutinated by viruses which have a lot of copies of the hemagglutinins on the surface. And then we treated them, we did the hemagglutination assay in the presence of our mucinomimetics to see whether we can inhibit that process. And if we can inhibit the process, that means that the virus is interacting with, with the mucinomimetic and not the cell surface. So first what we did is we looked at these two sugars individually. Okay, so this is just a trisaccharide, one, two, three and we measured how much of it we need to inhibit agglutination of red blood cells. And we used H1N1 virus, which still maintains some of the binding for the avian structure, but also has the human structure binding capacity. And, and these viruses were produced in eggs, uh, embryonated, embryonated chicken eggs, and so we can see the, the, the avian sugar was actually stronger inhibitor uh, on, the, on these mucinomimetics. So the virus recognized uh, the arrangement in the mucin, mucin-like arrangement of the avian sugars better than the, uh, sorry, in the, the, trisac the avian trisaccharide better than the, than the human one. Now, we looked at what happens if you actually arrange them on the, in a mucin, mucin-like ori orientation. And so we look at the short mimetic, and we saw that we got stronger binding for the avian sugars, but not necessarily for for the human one, and that continued as we increased the length. As we made the presentation more mucin-like, the virus bound more strongly to the avian sugars, but not really to the human ones. And so that was kind of surprising. This we were not surprised by. We thought that as you increase the copy numbers of the sugar, the binding should go up, but only for one of them. Well, in fact, when you, when you look at the mucosal barrier, the secreted mucins that are not cell surface associated have in our, in our lungs have a lot of these avian type structures which serve as decoys to trap the virus before it gets to the cell surface. However, on the cell surface, uh, the mucins will have mostly these two six glycans. And the virus doesn't seem to like them when, it, when they are organized in this form. It can bind to the, the, the trisaccharide, but when they are in the mucin form, not, not really. Okay, so that kind of gave us clues. Maybe the mucin presentation you know, helps. Mucin, even though they have a lot of sialic acids, do, are not really good targets for the virus. Now, we are in solution. These are soluble molecules. What happens if you actually create a brush, like you would see on a cell surface? So what we do is we print these brushes. Now we print them into microarrays, where our polymers are labeled with green, so we can see them actually being printed and attached to glass, and then we can probe them with the virus. And what we did is we varied a lot of parameters here. We made different lengths of polymers. We, uh, we spaced the sugars differently. We clustered them more into a more dense brush or spaced them out a little bit further apart so the virus can interact with them individually. And then we probed the binding. And what we saw was quite surprising. So in general, we thought if you get more 
if you put more of these receptors on the spot, you should get more virus bound. And that was not the case for, for either of these glycans. The red is the avian, the blue is the human. As you increase the number of copies of the sugar, overall binding goes down. So then we started to sort of parse it apart a little bit, and we saw, okay, this is measured binding to mucin mimetics that are very sparsely decorated in the glass, so that the virus interacts with, with only maybe one or two. They're far apart, so they don't create a brush. And what we saw is that the virus recognized better these avian sugars as we increase the copies on the polymer. That's what we saw in solution. We didn't really see much binding for these humans, human sugars. But what was really surprising was when we started bringing these polymers, these mucin mimetics closer together, overall, for both types of sugars, the, the binding of the virus actually went, went down. So mucins display a lot of these receptors that the virus likes. But in the mucin architecture and in the dense brush, that doesn't really actually improve binding of the virus, and in fact, it makes it worse. Okay. And so being able to model this glycocalyx in this really artificial system, we might st we're starting to get a glimpse of how mucins might potentially be protective at the cell surface, even though they have a lot of these receptors for the virus. Now, that was, that was a lot of analysis and a lot of hours uh, of my student who had to go through all of the binding data and correlated with, with the features of the material. And so we, too, uh, started to look towards artificial intelligence and, and machine learning. And we teamed up with a colleague at, um, at ASU, Abhishek Singaroy, and he helped us develop algorithms, algorithms to, pr pr <laughs> excuse me, to predict the binding patterns depending on the composition of the, of the mucosal glycocalyx uh, brush. And so what we see here is uh, definitely as we increase the mucin density, we see that we lose binding of the viruses. So our, our data, our machine learning data, uh, reflected uh, what we saw in the microarray using an, um, just manual uh, analysis. What's really interesting is that the viruses can adapt to better utilize the mucin display. So all what I've been showing you so far was collected in h one one which we produced in, in eggs. We can produce the virus also in mammalian cells, such as MDCK cells. And when we did, what we saw is that the, the pa binding pattern shifted towards being able to utilize these more dense brush-like displays of the receptor. In this case, the virus didn't change the sequence of the hemagglutinin. The hemagglutinin is still the same. But the virus is better able to engage these glycocalyx-like displays of the structure when it's produced in a mammalian cell. Now the question is why, and we're trying to pinpoint down what is the change, and one of the things that we observed that changed was, was the glycosylation of the hemagglutinins themselves. So these are the trimers of hemagglutinins with the sialic acid binding sites, and there are glycans around there that the virus picks up as it's produced in the mammalian cell. And so potentially this might be the reason why we see a different binding pattern without a change in the primary sequence of the, of the hemagglutinin. Another thing that we just recently discovered was that the virus shape has changed uh, in, in transition from egg culture to mammalian culture and, and, and went from spherical to filamental, which may potentially have an impact on how it interacts with, with the glycocalyx display. Okay. Okay, so being able to build these mucin models then allows us to, to uh, investigate how how viruses use multivalency to recognize these structures and how these structures could actually be evolved so that they don't uh, facilitate that interaction. Very quickly, since I have only a few minutes left, we then also became interested in modeling the physical barrier properties. So the virus has the neuromidases, which can cleave these sugars. So even though it could potentially grab onto the mucins, it eventually cleaves these sugars and needs to travel closer to the to the membrane, right, to engage other receptors that are in closer proximity so that the virus can fuse with the membrane and deliver its genetic material and start replicating. So we wanted to see whether, even after desilating these mucins, whether these mucins can still form a protective barrier against the, against the virus. I, I showed you that picture of that really dense brush. That must be very challenging for the virus to, to navigate. 
And so what we decided to do, and this is the work of my uh, uh, graduate student Dan Honigfort, he wanted to design a polymer that has the physical properties, not just the sort of architecture and multivalency of mucins, but actually physical property of mucins that build the glycocalyx. And so he designed a new set of polymers that kind of look like mucins. They're these sort of rod-like structures. Um, and, he, and he designed them so that we can introduce them into the cell surface. And here we use our red blood cells, which also have a glycocalyx, as shown here, but it's only about seven to eight nanometers in size. By the way, it harbors the ABO blood groups, which are also sugars, um, uh, that define your blood type. And so then we decided that we designed mucin mimetics that range from three nanometers to 40 nanometers in size and started introducing them into the cell surface. And first thing we observed was that when we started to add more and more and more of these mucin mimetics, the cells started to change shape. They become bloated. And that's because the, the brush creates pressure, entropic pressure on the membrane. And this was actually beautifully described and modeled by, by Matt Pasheg and his students. Uh, showing how cells can undergo morphological changes when they express high levels of mucins and it can for force the membranes to, to change shape and bend. And so this is something that we are seeing. So we are definitely crowding our, our glycocalyx as we, in, uh, as we add more of these mucin mimetics. So we took, we looked at the scenario that's, that's somewhere here where before we start to see morphological changes or significant morphological changes to these cells. We are close to being crowded. Um, and we studied what happens to viral binding. So the cells have the virus receptors. We use them for agg agglutination studies. And so we measured how, quick, how, how fast the virus bound to the cells as we increase the size of the glycocalyx. What you could see is that it, it slows down the binding of the virus as you go from short to medium to long polymers. If you take the medium polymer and you make it more crowded, the binding also goes down. So the, so the physical barrier shields the virus from binding. But then Dan went and he said, well, since, I'm, since I already bound that virus, let's see how quickly it dissociates. And what he observed and was unexpected is that all of these polymers, regardless, regardless of size, slow down the dissociation of the virus. The virus bound stronger. It didn't dissociate from the surface as well. And that was a little puzzling. And we started to think about you know, why that might be. So we used the lectin in place of virus so that we could do microscopy in our microscopy facility. And we looked at the, the binding of the lectin that also recognized salic acids and, and where it might be with respect to the polymers. And what we saw is that the lectin, which is the, the one in red here, and the green polymer sort of became excluded from one another. So they were not hanging out together. The lectins were where, where, the, where the polymers were not. Right? So there was a, the, they arranged in that, in that particular form. And so we started to think about clustering. You know, the lectins seem to be clustering away from the polymers. And if we are already in a crowded interface, that should increase crowding in the glycocalyx. And, it's, and the crowding in the glycocalyx may drive clustering of the lectins. So we designed a FRED model where we take, uh, took lectins, which had either a FRED pair either a, a donor or, or acceptor. And what we saw was that when we crowded the glycocalyx with our mucin mimetics, the lectins came closer together. We did the opposite. We put, we put these FRED probes on the polymers. And we saw that when we introduced the lectin, the polymers became more crowded. And so that kind of led us to a model where the, the glycocalyx, when it's extended, it shields the virus from entering the glycocalyx and binding to its receptors. But then it eventually comes down and it starts to, uh, and it starts to cluster these receptors. And it does it through crowding because the glycocalyx has these large mucins, but it also has the smaller underbrush, the glycolipids, the glycoproteins. And if the virus, because it's you know, maybe 200 nanometers in size, creates crowding, what happens to the smaller components? they will probably diffuse back underneath the virus where there's space. And if they carry silic acid, that basically allows the formation of this Velcro for the virus, where now you have a more dense patch of these, of these receptors right, that the virus can bind to. And that would explain why the virus binds more strongly, because it has more attachment points available. What we are testing now is what happens 
whether this process could also help the virus get to closer to the membrane. Because if these are the smaller components that are diffusing out of the crowded brush, so that would, make, that would actually bring the virus closer to the membrane and potentially facilitate fusion. And so we're developing chemical tools to, do, to, to merge this glycocalyx engineering approach with proteomics to, to, to see how the composition of the receptors actually changes as the virus, the virus nav navigates the glycocalyx. Of course, it would be wonderful to have imaging tools to actually see the, how the virus travels through the glycocalyx, uh, but those are not currently available. Okay, so just to kind of show you, this is, this is what we're thinking of. We're thinking of the ways that the, that the mucosal glycocalyx can prevent viral binding. And now, more recently, we started to think about how does the virus really subvert this, this mucosal barrier? Yes, indeed, it does provide a shield against the virus. But the virus can grab, maybe not strongly, but at least a little bit, onto the receptors in the mucins, and then use its physical shape and multivalent interactions to, to help, those, help itself for, to adhesion. Of course, it has enzymes that can remove the glycans, and it can release itself. Uh, uh, some other pathogens could also have enzymes that break down mucins to clear the path. And now we're also investigating how Viruses could use multivalent interactions to prevent shedding because mucins could be shed upon binding of a virus, but if the virus can actually reach across to multiple glycoconjugates, it could potentially stabilize itself. I don't have time to tell you about that story, but uh, we published uh, a recent study where we used photophysical cleavage or, or photocleavage of the glycocalyx uh, to look at shedding. What I do want to say is that if you are interested in glycans, there's a community here, um, and, a, and there's a, uh, it's the Glycobiology Research and Training Center. It's been around for about 20 years, and it's been a really um, a powerful resource for people who are interested in glycans, or just come across glycans and don't know how to deal with them, but want to, want to incorporate them to their research. Uh, and so we're here, but our faculty members span the entire state of California all the way up to Davis um, and Stanford. Um, I, I'm, I'm fortunate to be the, one of the co-directors with Mandy Lewis of the center. And we have uh, a lot of training opportunities for people. So starting with introduction to glycoscience course and more advanced glycobiology courses to, uh, to a journal club that, that runs every week. Um, the center has spearheaded the publication of, a, of an Essentials of Glycobiology textbook, which is the textbook in the field. And it's publicly available on NIH uh, for free. Um, and it's accessible. Uh, we have a glycoanalytics core, which can help you with analyses of glycans in your samples, if you're interested. Um, and more recently, we started a glyco boot camp, which is a two-week course in the summer where you can learn hands-on uh, tools to, uh, to isolate and analyze the glycomes of, of organisms. And we typically do this in the context of a disease model. This year, we'll be doing um, a type 2 diabetes model in mice and comparing the glycomes of, of healthy and type 2 diabetic mice. Um, so if you're interested, reach out to us, um, the GRTC at UCSD, uh, and um, we're a very welcoming community, so we've, uh, and we're here for you. So with that, thank you again for the introduction, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Do we have any questions? Thank you, Camille, that was fantastic. Uh, I was thinking during your talk about something you touched on towards the end, um, that the um, glycans themselves may be modifying the proteins on the surface of the virus or maybe glycans or other uh, proteins in that milieu by glycosylating them. And you mentioned that in the case of, uh, I think it was neuromelidase. So, um, I was just wondering whether, is there a whole new sort of um, field we have to kind of figure out here about this kind of spatially regulated post-translational modification networks that are modifying the, um, whether it be a ligand or a 
virus or something as it kind of enters this environment? Yeah, I, I think so. And it's always been there, the need to have these sort of tools, uh, because glycans on the protein, on any protein really, will affect the, the, the physical properties of the protein and its interactions with others. And so, so when studying proteins, oftentimes the first thing that you do is you remove the glycans or you express the glycan in E. coli, which doesn't have the, the human type of glycosylation. So it's, it's really important. It's always been there, but it has not been a focus. But it's becoming uh, more and more a focus in at least two different areas. One is the development of biologics. So antibody uh, therapeutics or protein therapeutics, these proteins have to be glycosylated and to, in order to actually increase their residence time in, blood, in, in, a, in a serum. And they also have to be glycosylated with human glycan so they don't create antigenic responses. On the other hand, the other big area where glycosylation of proteins makes a big difference is, is, is glycosylation of viral proteins. This is the reason why we have to take the seasonal flu vaccines, because, because influenza tends to add glycosylation every year. And when it adds a glycan on the hemagglutinin, now that spot becomes less visible to our immune system. Right? So when we develop antibodies, we develop it against the HA, but if it changes and it adds a glycan, it'll mask that side. Uh, HIV, for instance, has a high level of glycosylation on, on, the, on its surface proteins, which makes it invisible to the immune system. So glycosylation of, of viral proteins is actually a very important area of vaccine development. SARS-CoV-2, you've probably have seen these beautiful models generated by Romeo Amaro, uh, looking at all of the different glycans on the, on the virus, uh, spike protein, and some of them actually having functional roles in promoting adhesion to, to the ACE receptor. So, yeah. Do they affect the motility of water at the sort of molecular scale? In other words, when we make molecular dynamics models of, say, of membrane-associated proteins, we'll include the lipid and we'll include the water, mm -hmm. but we don't include the glycans or the, their impact on the water. Yes, absolutely, um, big, big time. Glycans are, are heavily hydrated, and that's actually one of the reasons for the low microscopic affinities, yeah. because you have to do, undergo a s significant desolvation of the glycan binding side and, and, and also the glycan. And, and the glycans have a lot of hydroxyl groups, so, so that causes a lot of energy. Yeah. yeah, the tools are not really there. Like what, what Romy does with molecular dynamic simulations, probably the state of the art is really phenomenal. Um, and you cannot look at glycans in a static form. You have to look at them in a dynamic form because, because they're, not, they're not static. Just the concept of, of evolution of antibodies against glycans, right? How do you, if, if glycans are flexible and floppy, how do you develop a high specificity antibody against the glycan? It's, it happens, but you know, what, which, which conformer is the evolution select, selecting for? Great, thank you. Let's thank our speaker one more time. Thanks. And I'll invite all the trainees who are giving a lightning talk to come stand up on the side to keep things moving. Um, okay, so the next segment that we have, I just want to introduce is that we have um, some lightning talks, which are supposed to be uh, five-minute talks given by some of the trainees. And um, we have um, our judges, um, Marcus, who is a, um, a trainee um, uh, for the Interfaces program, and um, Professor Gadula, who you just saw um, present. Um, and... Um, 
Yeah, so let's uh, get going with that. Cool. So I will set a timer okay. for five yeah, minutes. Yeah, sure. Cool. Uh, should you just start? When are you ready? Give me one second. Okay, starting now. Okay. Hi, I'm Alex. I'm a second year PhD student co-advised by Dr. Karen Chrisman and uh, Dr. Nathan Janeski. And today I'll be discussing the characterization of naturally derived materials for treatment of myocardial infarction. So myocardial infarction, or MI, is really just a heart attack. And each year there are over 805,000 new and recurrent cases of MI in the U.S. alone. And the cause of it is coronary artery blockage. So as you can see on the right, this is the coronary artery and it feeds oxygen rich blood to a portion of your left ventricle. And as a result of this blockage, pretty much there's no oxygen being delivered to that portion. And the left ventricle is the chamber in your heart that pumps blood to your entire body. And so as a result of this no oxygen, there's cell death, inflammation, and overall just damage to, the, uh, to that portion that gets no oxygen. And so, what happens is, is that your heart essentially tries to compensate for this damaged region. And this is known as negative left ventricular remodeling. And essentially what happens is this compensation acts as a negative feedback loop that actually worsens the initial injury. And long term, this leads to LV dilation and ultimately heart failure. And the main problem right now is that there are no treatments that exist on the market that prevent this negative LV remodeling while also promoting tissue repair and regeneration. So, here in the Chrisman lab, we have two extracellular matrix or ECM based materials for treatment of MI. So on the left, you can see it's our full ECM. This can be injected minimally invasively through transendocardial injection for human patients. It forms a hydrogel after injection, and it is shown to mitigate negative LV remodeling while also has completed phase one clinical trials. And then on the right, we have our IECM. This material can be delivered even less invasively through intravenous or intracoronary delivery. This one is blood safe, so it does not form a hydrogel after injection. And, it is, and through intracoronary delivery, it has shown efficacy in small and large animal MI models. And so as a material science student, oh, I think I voice. Oh, actually, to create this material, we start by isolating the left ventricle of a pig heart. So the idea is to use a left ventricle derived material to treat a left ventricle injury. And the reason why we remove all the cells is because injection of a foreign species of cells could cause inflammation, which would worsen your injury. So we go through this process of decellularization. We chop up the tissue to make sure to help remove the cells faster. After removing all the cells, we are left with just the ECM components, which is shown in panel B, which is uh, the white tissue. Then we take this tissue, we mill it down into a powder, and then we digest it with enzymes, and this yields our full ECM, which will form that hydrogel after injection into the heart. To create the IECM, we pretty much take our full ECM and process it further. In order to do so, we use centrifugation to remove pretty much the large portions within the full ECM. And so we're left with just the soluble portions seen at the top in panel E. We filter this, and then we process it further to get our IECM shown in G. So just an idea of just the particle size distribution. Here's an SDS page gel. So as you could see in the top in the red, you can see these are the large molecular weight components that are present in our full ECM, but are no longer present in our IECM. And so as a material science student, my goal is to characterize the fundamental material properties and the differences between the full ECM and IECM on different scales. And the primary technique I'll be using is cryogenic transmission electron microscopy. So pretty much what happens in this, uh, in this technique is that you take a liquid sample and you flash freeze it in liquid nitrogen, at, which is about negative 200 degrees Celsius. And the advantage of this is that you could look at as close to the native state as it will be allowed for this technique. And so you get to look at the fibrillar structure of the proteins uh, from the liquid state. So you have a liquid state, you blot it, and then you freeze it. And so what I wanted to do first now was to compare full ECM versus IECM just uh, images. And so as you can see on the left is our full ECM, on the right is the IECM. And here highlighted in red actually are these type 1 collagen bundles that seem to be removed in our IECM. Um, while here highlighted in green are just some of the soluble portions that are conserved between both. And so this led to the hypothesis that type 1 collagen is the main driver for hydrogel formation, where our IECM no longer has it and, no longer, and thus no longer forms that uh, hydrogel. So I decided to compare samples before gelation and samples after gelation. And what we find here is we actually find longer range type 1 collagen bundle alignment. So this is a more zoomed out image. Uh, as seen on the left, the, right, or the, the red labeled 
uh, seem to be randomly oriented type 1 collagen, while on the right it's green. Uh, it seems to be some sort of long-range alignment. And with this, we have future experiments planned to try and ensure reproducibility while also quantify and um, understand the kinetics behind this gelation. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge my lab as well as our collaborators. Thank you, Alex. Next up, we have Justin. Okay, it's on. Um, before we start with the next talk, does anyone have any questions for the previous speaker? If not, we can have more discussion during lunch. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Justin Jaco, and I am in Ajit Barkey's lab studying more about glycobiology. So thanks to Camille, I don't have to go over a lot of this different mechanism, but I am going to tell a story in basically five minutes that spans almost three centuries. So without further ado, I'm going to begin. And I love this image. This image is what kind of pulled me into the glycobiology realm uh, because it reminds me of a lake in Michigan because uh, there's a small little lake where I'm from called Duck Lake. And if you run out on the pier and jump out, you will feel all of these things on your legs, and it's kind of like the seaweedy part of the lake. And I've always appreciated it because that reminds me of the glycocalyx. And this is, uh, has a large mass, and in some cells it's actually larger than the mass of the, all of the contents inside itself. So the story begins in the late 1800s when chronic disease wasn't really a thing. The thing that was killing most people across the world was infectious diseases. It was the number one killer throughout most of humanity and they needed to treat that. So they heat treated diphtheria, for example, injected it in horses, and then took the horse serum, which had antibodies against it, to treat diphtheria. Unfortunately, those patients who were mostly children, while they were now protected against dying from diphtheria, they developed a strange reaction. Uh, and it was reported so much in the scientific literature that it got a medical diagnosis called serum sickness, which is a broad range of inflammatory um, feelings of illness, not feeling well, hives, lots of different reactions that were happening in the body that were nonspecific. It wasn't until several, several decades later that it was understood that it was a salic acid difference that was in this horse serum of a salic acid that we don't have. And so for lack of time, just know that we have two different salic acids in mammals. Um, most mammals have both. Humans, unfortunately, or fortunately, lost it. And this happened around two million years ago, and no one knows for sure why that is. But it was still detected in people, in healthy tissues and in diseased tissues, in people who never were vaccinated with the original diphtheria um, compounds that had that horse serum, salic acid in it. And it turns out the reason it was, is we think it's becoming, it's coming from the diet. And so diet, specifically red meat, is enriched in this non-human salic acid called NU5GC, again, that we don't have but it's in the diets that we consume. And it mistakenly gets incorporated into cell surfaces, which causes low-grade uh, inflammation. And you can see here in this mouse model that the tissues in which the salic acid, which is non-human, that accumulates in our tissues creates a low-grade systemic inflammatory response. We've seen this in endothelial cells, cells that line the blood vessels, and we've seen this in epithelial cells, cells that line the GI tract, for example. This is where I come into play, and it turns out we can actually find a biomarker of red meat consumption in the uh, serum of patients today. And it's a metabolite of this non-human salic acid, NU5GC, which we, can be, which we can detect in serum. And the glycol group here gets attached to this molecule called chondroitin sulfate, which is a repeating disaccharide. It's a glycosaminoglycan. The goal is to see if we can find a correlation between individuals who consume red meat and if there's an increased risk for heart disease or colorectal cancer, for example. We can do this with uh, patient samples that we have archived from the Nurses' Health Study, which follows patients over three decades. So we have over 30 years of serum samples collected so we can detect this. But this is where the story gets really interesting, and it turns out that chondroitin sulfate not only is just a marker in serum, it's also found in the bone matrix. And it's very likely that this biomarker could help us with refined techniques of detecting chondroitin sulfate in bones 
and understanding who led us up to uh, us, which early hominins led to us in our story. And I think that's one of science's most alluring questions, uh, and it's exciting to see how we um, might actually better get there in that lineup of who led to us. So lots of sign significance and innovation here for dietary protocols, implementation of this in clinical settings potentially, there's environmental implications that go beyond understanding uh, the impact of red meat consumption on the planet, and also with anthrobiology and ecology. I think there's a lot to learn here, and it just it comes back to glycans, and it's pretty exciting to be a part of this field and to look for this new biomarker, because again, a lot of the techniques that we have are pretty invasive, and we want something streamlined that we can get. And with mass spec analysis, we can detect this, and that is uh, where we hope to go. I don't have time to go into the mechanism, but it seems to get pushed down to the chondroitin sulfate path. Maybe some other glycosaminoglycans get that uh, tag on it, but to be determined. So without that, I would like to say thank you. And this is the fossil bed where we can uh, get some of these samples. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Yes. So like after, uh, oh, thank you. Cool, F fascinating, um, fascinating talk. So after a single uh, dose or consumption of red meat, right, um, how long does this neuro 5GC and its metabolites persist in the body? Correct, so Dietary consumption is a very challenging thing to understand because it turns out that certain sialic acids in combination with other sialic acids can inhibit. So if you have more of the new 5 ac in the diet, it can kind of competitively inhibit. But for example, if you consume chronic red meat and particularly processed red meat, that seems to be more bioavailable and readily absorbed and presented on cell surfaces rather than in free form, which is found in dairy and other types of uh, yogurt-based products. So undetermined, but we're looking for like the long-term consumption. Yeah. And that's the best data we have with the nurse's health study. Yeah, Andrew. So there uh, are people who have um, developed allergies to meat that has been connected with uh, exposure to um, animal protein through um, through, through uh, tick bites in certain parts of the country, um, and I have a feeling this was is closely connected, but I don't. I believe that's alpha gal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah alpha gal. Yeah. Mm. So okay. different so glycan. Different glycan, but yeah. it's a similar concept. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which again explains that we need to be focusing on diet and clinical care. At least have it on our radar. Is if we're unaware of it, we're going to continue to miss it. Great. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. Next everybody. up, we'll have uh, Bianca Pena. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Bianca Pena. I am a second year PhD student, uh, co-advised by Dr. Karen Chrisman and Dr. Mariana Alperin. Uh, and today I'll be talking to you about uh, the first phase of my project to characterize the response to injury in a pregnant model to prevent pelvic floor disorders. To give you an intro, pelvic floor disorders uh, span urinary and fecal incontinence, which is basically not having control of when you can go to the bathroom and uh, pelvic organ prolapse. And pelvic floor disorders negatively impact approximately 30% of women in the United States, and this percentage only increases with age. Um, and currently, there is no tissue engineering approach or therapeutic to try and to try and prevent this pelvic organ prolapse or urinary and fecal incontinence. Uh, so my main focus is pelvic organ prolapse, uh, seen on the right here, where you can see the shifting and descending of the organs highlighted in purple. Uh, which can cause uh, constant pain and irritation. Uh, but currently, as I mentioned, there is no kind of sustainable uh, therapeutic. Uh, the main contributor to prolapse is actually vaginal childbirth injury. 
So vaginal delivery is a major risk factor for pelvic organ prolapse. Uh, and kind of what causes this prolapse uh, is these, the weakening of pelvic floor muscles, which you can see here, uh, that form this hammock sling shape. And over time, after a vaginal childbirth injury, uh, these pelvic floor muscles weaken, and as a hammock, if you sit in it for too long, it kind of sinks further and further down. That's kind of what's happening here, uh, which causes that descending of pelvic organs. So my main target is these pelvic floor muscles and trying to look at that injury uh, on a muscle level to try and target that early before prolapse develops. So with that, since vaginal delivery is a major risk factor, I want to look at a translationally relevant pregnant model. Um, however, to kind of give you some background, the CRISM lab has developed a non-pregnant rat model to recapitulate atrophy and fibrosis. Uh, shown here, you can see this is the simulated birth injury model that we use uh, with a vaginal distension procedure. Uh, and with this non-pregnant model, we've shown that with this five milliliter distension volume, you get these what we call ghost fibers or dying myofibers highlighted with the arrows. Uh, kind of like the absence of that pinkish color that you see on the right side. So my main goal is to look, as I mentioned, to look in the pregnant model since pregnancy has a lot of different adaptations and circumstances that you can't really recapitulate in a non-pregnant model. And one of those is hormonal changes. So for example, estrogen levels vary after uh, vaginal delivery and throughout the pregnancy uh, term. So that is something I'm looking forward to, to looking into further. Uh, but the first basically goal of mine was to try and develop an injury model in this pregnant rat kind of procedure. So Validating the pregnant simulated birth injury model, I wanted to look at necrotic myofibers to kind of ensure we're getting that myofiber death immediately. So this is a non-pregnant five milliliter distension volume. And you can see uh, here, I use an IgG marker uh, in green. So the more green you see, the more injury and the more dying myofibers there are. Uh, and then the pregnant model, I wanted to use a higher distension volume because there's a lot of pregnancy induced adaptations there. So with the seven milliliter volume, you can't really see that much of those necrotic myofibers. However, with the 10 mil distension volume, you kind of see a similar image to that non-pregnant five mil. And you can kind of see that here. So I decided to move forward with this 10 mil distension volume to kind of recapitulate what we've seen in non-pregnant. Another outlook that I was looking at uh, was fibrotic content. So looking at collagen one content, I was able to recapitulate that in injury. So using that 10 mil distension volume that I just mentioned, uh, we're able to kind of see this upregulation of collagen one content uh, between those myofibers. So it's intramuscular collagen content. Um, and here we can see that with the injury, there is an increase. However, it is interesting that there's kind of a high basal level there in the uninjured, which kind of gives you an idea of how pregnancy can change the natural fibrotic content there. So my future directions to kind of uh, look into what Alex mentioned uh, earlier is using our decellularized material for an intramuscular um, injection and using different analysis, so immunohistochemistry analysis here uh, taking that multi-scale approach, looking at spatial transcriptomics as well to get that spatial gene expression analysis uh, and ex vivo active and passive mechanical testing to look at the muscle on a tissue level. And with that, I'd like to thank both of my labs and all the funding sources. Thank you. Do you have any questions from the audience? Thank you, Bianca, for interesting talk, very Thank important you. application. Um, I just wanted to ask you, why uh, wouldn't you be using a regular pregnancy in a rat? Um, and why do you need to create a model with a balloon? Is it just because it's faster to, to do 